uh, guests from around the world participate in these programs, um, and they always wind up uh, with many good questions as well as uh, some good exchanges of information. Before we get started, what I'd like to do is uh, make sure that people can hear me. Now, the hard part is, if you can't hear me, you're not going to be able to do this. So, in the chat box, I'll also uh, type in, uh, can everyone hear me? And then, if not, uh, chat back. But if you can hear me, uh, raise your hand on the uh, the little control panel that's sitting on your uh, on your program there. There'll be a hand, and if you can hit that, then I know that uh, I'm getting through, and that you're listening at the other end. This is doing real well. Glad glad to see that uh, people are on board and and uh, and things are working. Uh, so second. Uh, test. Uh, so if you can for me, go ahead and take your, your hand down. That way I, I know that you're not uh, um, asking me a question right now as well. Uh, it'll help us uh, get through, uh, help me notice whether there's questions or not. Second thing is the question box is there on your control panel as well. Throughout the program, if you have a question, please feel free to type it in as we go. Uh, and I'll try to address the questions as we go. Um, so that we're close to the material on which the question is based. And then at the end of the program, uh, we're going to go for an hour, because that's what was advertised on the uh, program. We'll go for an hour, but if people stay on the phone asking questions for another hour, your certificate of attendance will show that you were on that phone for another hour and uh, participated in the question and answer session, which is education as well because there's always good exchange of information back and forth amongst uh, uh, the people that are on the line. The people that are on the line include FCA contractor members, specifier architects uh, that may be members of the Construction Specifications Canada, their program, uh, their annual conference is coming up next week in Winnipeg, the Construction Specifications Institute, the AIA, uh, the ALA, uh, the International Code Council, as well as uh, the uh, NFPA. We've got uh, friends from all kinds of organizations, including FCIA members. And if you're not an FCIA member, we certainly hope you join. So um, let's see. I've got one uh, that says no uh, is an answer to the question. So that means either he can't hear me or something. So if there's some reason that uh, um, you can't hear me, um, then sign off your computer part and sign back on. So I'm going to quickly type a chat. And then we'll get rolling with today's program. So good morning, everyone from Chicago. For our friends in the Middle East, uh, late good afternoon, almost evening. And uh, those that are in other parts of the world, we're glad that you hopped on the phone with us. My name is Bill McHugh. I'm the Executive Director of the Firestop Contractors International Association and have been since its inception in 1998. Um, my job is to represent FCIA throughout the world, presenting, speaking, writing, and then also manage the association's affairs as well. We have a staff of uh, uh, one, two, three, four people, five people actually, uh, that help us with the FCIA. Uh, not all of them are full-time, but uh, we do have a, a good-sized staff that helps out. You might hear from Lindsay, uh, Kathy, Sandy, and Linda. Uh, I work together with them, and without them, uh, I'm kind of lost, actually, because they take care of the details for me. Today's program is about inspection. And although I've got the whole DIIM up here, I'm going to try to skip right through that part and get to the inspection, because we've got quite a bit of material that covers that as well. Uh, the material that we're going to cover, obviously, Certainly, uh, i cover a little bit about FCI. I'll take two minutes. Uh, we're a trade association, uh, member contractors, manufacturers, Firestop Special Inspection Agency companies, uh, Firestop Contractor companies, manufacturers rep agencies. Um, and then there's also a category for building code officials who are in government employee, uh, as, as well as uh, 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 fire marshals that are also in government employee, call friends of FCIA. We get involved in the code development hearings. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in 
uh, Memphis, Tennessee as part of the Fire Safety Committee to uh, represent FCIA and the fire resistance industry, voting on various proposals that were put forward. They participated ASTM for the development of the standards and the uh, test standards for fire stopping, as well as the ASTM E2174293. Um, the DIIM, this philosophy, is something that started at our very first meeting in 1999. Uh, the FCIA organized around this DIIM philosophy. The design, inspection, installation, and maintenance of fire stopping is uh, a very important piece of what FCIA does. We try to present it everywhere we go as well. What does it consist of? A good specification. Uh, we believe that the 078400 is the right spec to be presenting uh, from an architectural perspective. It keeps everything in one place and eliminates confusion as to what takes place in this very one uh, or this very specialized field of fire stopping. The tested and listed systems, we take our hats off to all of the manufacturer companies that have invested millions of dollars in testing uh, through ASTM E814, UL1479 for uh, penetrations, UL2079 for joints, EFM4990, which covers joints and penetrations at FM approvals, the ULC S115 standard, which has both joints and penetrations in it, and the ASTM E2307, wherever the manufacturers spend their money, whether it's at Intertech, FM approvals, Underwriters Laboratories, ULC, we're glad that they do because it sets up the suitability for use statement of the products and specific applications. We believe in professional installation by an FCI member, FM approved contractor, or UL, ULC qualified contractor. We believe these systems should be properly inspected. ASTM E2174 and 2393, the standards for inspection. Uh, we believe that the uh, special inspection agency to be accredited and that the individual should have certifications or pass an exam of some kind. Uh, and we'll talk more about that later. And then maintain and manage. We're not going to focus on the maintenance heavily, although we'll talk about it if we have time. We're not going to focus on installation, but we will just focus on these two pieces, test and listed systems and inspection, because they're related. Believe it or not, the inspection of fire stopping and the installation are basically the same knowledge base required. Why? Because systems selection, systems analysis is the same skill. It's only the reverse, one of the other. Secondly, knowledge of both is required in order to properly install or inspect. Thirdly, contractors have to inspect their own work, and those people need to understand how to inspect. That's why the knowledge base is the same for all of those pieces. Quality process is a circle. Um, the proper design, installation, inspection, and maintenance of fire stopping results in reliable installed systems. The reliable installed systems are there for a reason. They're there to make sure that people can walk through uh, areas of egress during a fire and still escape unscathed. They're also there for property protection, as well as to prove that the fire stop system uh, works when it's been installed to the test and listed system. So we talked about who FCIA is. If you don't get the, currently the Life Safety Digest, email us at info at fcia.org. Be happy to get you one. FCIA belong, uh, believes in total fire protection. Uh, all these things are needed to make sure that a building is safe, whether it's a sprinkler, detection, alarm system, education of the occupants, or effective compartmentation. They're all needed. So if we go to the Middle East, uh, our friends over there have added things. Our friend Saifuddin Tahir, our friend Sarah Metzger, who uh, was in uh, Doha in Qatar. Over there, they mentioned that not only is the DIIM needed, but also the C, coordination of the penetrating items and where they occur on the wall or the floor. And then management and maintenance. The management results in barrier management systems. Barrier Management Symposium has been a great successful program that the FCIA has de delivered along with Underwriters Laboratories, the American Society for Healthcare Engineering, and the Joint Commission 
to help increase the knowledge base of those facility engineers that have to manage those barriers after they're turned over in new construction. Uh, the better maintenance there is of barriers similar to what you would happen in the alarms and the detection as well as the sprinkler system, the more reliable that system is going to be. And if it takes place on an annual basis, it also means that the reliability is there and that the cost is spread amongst many years so that at the end of the day, the building owner and manager is not stuck with a great big bill to catch up with the 20 years worth of uh, holes in the wall that many of the trades have created. Fire stopping is required by code. I'm not going to read these codes, uh, but our, for our friends in Canada, uh, the, uh, the uh, National Building Code of Canada dictates uh, fire stopping, uh, Chapter 3 and 4. A UAE Fire and Life Safety Code of Practice, which is their fire code, also has it. And then Chapter 7 of the International Building Code and Fire Code, you'll find um, uh, fire stopping in all those areas. Fire resistance is, is defined in codes. And you'll also find a similar definition at UL, such that it's the time and minutes or hours that the materials or assemblies have stood of fire exposures determined by test, methods based on tests or the code. These three things, test would be ASTM E814, UL1479. Methods based on tests would be engineering judgments uh, done by the manufacturer, submitted under 104.11 of the uh, uh, International Building Code or alternative methods, whether you're in Canada or other parts of the world, uh, those things are allowed. And then thirdly, where it says this code, in Chapter 7 of the Building Code, towards the end, there are equivalent thicknesses as had been uh, declared uh, by the code and through testing that took place many years ago that says that if the wall made of concrete block has two inches of concrete um, on each side, in other words, uh, the holes in the middle create a, a structural wall on each end of that concrete block, that Thickness, the equivalent thickness is the amount of material required to get yourself to that rating. So if in a concrete floor, the equivalent thickness for that floor is two and a half inches minimum, and it's a two and a half inch to five inch metal deck, then the equivalent thickness would be two, two and a half inches for that, that uh, assembly. And that's written in the code in chapter seven, uh, it, towards the back, 721 in certain code versions. Uh, the numbering system will vary depending on the year. It's there for continuity through openings and penetrations. Um, and again, we'll, you'll find uh, various things uh, explained in the codes about fire resistance rate of construction. So it's fire barriers, uh, fire walls, uh, exterior walls, smoke barriers. They're all going to have various requirements. Key thing to remember, whether inspecting or installing, is that a smoke barrier in their international codes uh, it's not currently in the Canadian National Building Code, nor is it in the NFPA 5000 or NFPA 101. But in the International Building Code, which also is uh, similar to the Abu Dhabi National Building Code in the Middle East, used for governmental occupancies until 2016, at which time we are understanding from the Department of Municipal Affairs that it may wind up in commercial industrial institutional buildings. However, you can bet that some of the buildings over there, like the Cleveland Clinic and other buildings that are uh, owned by or owned partially by American or organizations that are under the international codes, that they're going to request that or require that these systems comply to these standards. First one is the smoke barrier. Smoke barrier is an hourly rated assembly with an L rating. In the International Building Code, as of 2006, it required a, a less than five cubic feet per minute per square foot of opening area. In the 2009 version of the code, it expanded it to say less than 50 cubic feet per minute per 100 square foot of wall area. The International or the Abu Dhabi National Building Code is based on the IBC 2009. So this is in that part of the country or the uh, the world as well. What does that mean? That means that somebody has to count up the number of penetrating items as they go through the wall, and make sure it doesn't exceed 50 CFM per 100 square foot of wall area. That means the tested listed system has to be an L-rated system. 
and that the number's got to stay under that number. So for the contractors, keep an eye on that. For the special inspection agencies, also keep an eye on it. For the architects, make sure it's specified in Division 7, 078400, that the L rating in smoke barriers must comply with this uh, less than 50 CFM per 100 square foot of wall area. Uh, the, the good thing is that the smoke barrier occurs mainly in healthcare occupancies, but some building owners and managers will request that or require that the structure be built above code and these things be in the, in the, uh, in the building as well. So fire stopping is used in, in all of these different assemblies based on when it's either required by code or when the building owner manager decides they want to have it. It may be used in exterior walls when the, the distance between those two buildings is less than uh, the, the distance where the exterior wall would not require to have those openings protected. Used in fire walls, fire barriers, fire partitions, smoke barriers, uh, and sometimes in smoke partitions, depending on whether or not the scope of work calls for it. Continuous fire resistance is re what's required, whether it's the wall, floor, whatever. Uh, the fire stop works in conjunction with the uh, fire damper, the smoke damper, fire doors and hardware systems, and the fire rate glazing. All of these are tested and listed systems and return the floor to the fire rating it had before they poked a hole through it. The scope of work may say that the chemical biological radiation resistance and explosion resistance has to be uh, appropriate. Uh, the blast strength actually is, is measured more um, differently than the 2PSF. That was the original code change from the Terrorism Resistant Building Committee at the ICC. There's a different requirement now, and we can get into that uh, during another uh, webinar. So effective compartmentation limits the spread of smoke and fire between floors, between compartments, in all kinds of different occupancies. I'm not going to spend time on these two statistical uh, slides. Why? Because we covered them in other webinars. Key point is, uh, when you add up all of the things in a building that work, it results in a safe building, not just the compartmentation, sprinklers, alarms, or egress strategies. Moving forward, effective compartmentation covers all these things. These are all based on systems. The UL system for fire dampers is 555-555S, covering radiation dampers and ceilings, as well as uh, those dampers in walls and floors. The fire rated glazing, tested to UL 10, uh, uh, as well as the door, UL 10, A, B, C, and D. Uh, UL, uh, our ASTM E119 is also used for the glazing. And then ASTM E14 for the penetrating items. The whole goal of fire stopping, the whole thing that has to be done, is that regardless of whether this person is an installer or an inspector, working for a contractor company, the installer, working for a special inspection agency, the inspector, the whole objective is find the fire resistance rated walls on the life safety drawings, and then review those life safety drawings to make sure that the penetrating items, the systems used to, to restore those rated walls and floors to what they were before someone poked a hole through it, make sure that, that those match exactly uh, to the conditions in the field. Then product data sheets are required to be on the project site, as well as the safety data sheets. These are needed for the installer and the inspector who are exposed to these chemicals as well as uh, fibrous materials that might be used uh, during fire stop operations. So first things first, match the systems on the left to the holes on the right. How do we do that? First we understand that, that what the test method is. We realize that the testing is the suitability for use statement for the specific application. Uh, we understand that there's all kinds of different products that might be used to make a fire stop system, that not one just, not just one product makes for a fire stop system. It's all of these products combined along with the tested and listed assembly, the wall, the floor, uh, the penetrating items, the opening size, the space, the covering on the penetrating items, or not, the type of that covering, uh, the type of the wall, the type of the penetration, et cetera, et cetera. All of this turns into a fire stop product when it's tested to a listed system. Key things to remember about these fire dampers is that the damper manufacturer and the AH, AHJ, authority having jurisdiction, have to agree whether or not to seal up the 
flange around the perimeter of this fire damper duct. Um, the fire damper manufacturers test these to UL555. The fire stop industry tests to UL1479. Sometimes there are combination system tested. Whether it's Green Hack or Ruskin, both of the major manufacturers of fire dampers have tested large openings with multiple fire dampers in the same assembly with fire stop around the annular space. On one side of the assembly, the annular space may have a covering of angles, as you can see in this picture. On the other side of the wall, likely in a tested enlisted system, the angles have been removed and substituted for clips. A lot faster, a lot cheaper to install, but only if the tested enlisted system allows it. Otherwise, adding fire stop sealant around the perimeter of these fire uh, dampers shouldn't take place unless the fire damper manufacturer agrees with it, unless the scope of work has asked for it, and unless the authority having jurisdiction has covered it as well. So from an inspection perspective, what would the inspector ask for? Show me the tested list system that allows me to fire stop around the perimeter of this. Secondly, at where's the uh, authority from the uh, manufacturer, not the authority, but the approval from the manufacturer, saying that you, such and such a fire stop sealant can be used around the perimeter of that fire damper where it touches the uh, fire rated wall assembly. Documentation is critical in our industry and permissions needed to add anything that's not listed in the tested listed system. System selection is important. Understanding these tested and listed systems and where all these ratings are, are very important because um, they're specified in specifications. Provide the F rating equal to the fire resistance rated assembly, whether horizontal or vertical. Provide a T rating equal to the fire resistance rated assembly in floors uh, as required by the uh, specification and or the building code. H rating. Host stream test is not always required in Canada. It's mandatory throughout the U.S., but Canada is not uh, mandatory. Very, very few exceptions there are for host stream test in Canada. So mainly it's all host stream test. L rating for smoke resistance. W rating for water resistance. The ULC S115 in Canada covers all of these things except for the W rating. Uh, and then again, the host stream test is optional in some cases. In the US, T rating is, is mandatory always. Um, and there's different reasons why that T rating exists. Uh, the main reason is if the heat of that uh, fire heats up a metal pipe on one side of the fire resistance rated assembly, it can catch on fire combustible items on the top side of the assembly. There's a big discussion going on at the code hearing. As a matter of fact, there were three different code proposals, one from Hilti, one from the International Fire Stop Council, and one from the FCIA to try to change how the T rating is dealt with by the building codes. And this is US and Canada both. For instance, the, the code says that regardless of uh, the fire resistance, I'm sorry, the fire transmission, not fire transmission, transmission of heat, from one side of the assembly to the next, that concrete grout, full thickness of the assembly or the thickness is required to make the fire resistance rating, doesn't need to have a T rating. Yet fire stopping does need to have a tight T rating. So there are ways to, uh, you know, let's say it says uh, on the spec that we need an equal F and T rating, uh, not equal, a fire resistance rating uh, required equal to the fire resistance of the floor and the T rating required equal to the fire resistance rating of the floor. If those two things are required, then the only way really to get around it is it in the code it says that concrete grout full thickness or that appropriate thickness does not need to have a T rating. Does that mean that the fire stop assembly is equally as safe? In our opinion, no, it's not. It doesn't mean that it's equally as safe. Um, what does it mean? It means if the specifier asks for worst case and the code asks for least case, then a request for information must be filed uh, before changing uh, to something of that uh, nature. Watch that. What were the three code proposals? Hilti said get rid of the T rating for um, horizontal assemblies because grout doesn't need it. That did not pass at the committee. Uh, FCIA uh, 
said that when it's hidden in the wall, uh, do it differently. And then the third one from the International Fire Stop Council dealt with it in a different way. I don't recall the exact specifics about those two, those other two assemblies. I can tell you that all three of them went down. Post stream test required all the time. <clears throat> now on to the systems. Whether it's at Underwriters Laboratories, Intertech down in San Antonio or wherever, FM approvals in Boston, the Firestop systems are listed in directories. Those systems can be analyzed, whether you're the inspector, special inspector, approved by the AHJ, uh, working for a special inspection agency or the contractor. Key things to remember, this one is for both US and Canada, or, or worldwide in Canada, I should say. Canada has some very unique requirements on the pressure in the furnace for plastic penetrating items and then also uh, the hose stream test not required in certain applications. Looking at this system very quickly, we can see it's a head of wall assembly, fire resistance rated floor, concrete on top, fire resistance rated wall also made out of concrete. At the head of wall assembly, it's showing penetrating items. Uh, why? Because those penetrating items, uh, the electrician or the plumber or the communication person sees a hole at the top of the wall. It's a lot easier to go through somebody else's hole than cut your own. So they just reduce the amount of time it took them to, to assemble that assembly. And decided, let's just go through that head of wall assembly. So the manufacturers have gotten smart and done some uh, testing on this. It's got an assembly rating of two hours, joint width max of four, class two movement, 25% uh, plus or minus, I'm sorry, or 60. 16% uh, on the extension, 25% so compression, 16% on extension, L rating less than one, which is uh, basically the best that you can get. And it does have both the F and T for the, the Canadian version. Uh, moving down further, through penetrating items, uh, metal pipes or cables, and then it'll describe what the sizes are. Inch and a half, schedule five steel pipe, or a conduit of inch and a half for cables. And it'll talk about the maximum sizes of those cables as well. Uh, and then it'll give a limitation. Maximum of 10 penetrants per 10 lineal feet may be installed within the separation. Uh, the annular space between the penetrants also has to be minimum of inch and a quarter. So let's take a look at the picture on these two things. If we notice that the, the cables are bundled together from the inspection perspective, guess what, we're rejecting that system. Are we then looking for another system, maybe the, uh, the contractor to cover themselves uh, to make sure that they don't have to go for an engineering judgment? Absolutely, that's the next step. Uh, would it be tear it out if there's no system? Yep, that's exactly what they're doing, tearing it out and starting over again by separating the cable so that the annular space is big enough between the two. Secondly, a special inspector will have to count up the number of penetrating items per 10 lineal feet. So simply stand on the edge, count up one, two, three, four, five, six in the uh, distance. If we call this 10 lineal feet between the uh, edges of my screen here, then we can understand that they've complied with the tested and listed system, which limits it to 10 lineal feet and 10 penetrating items in those assemblies. We also got to look for inch and a quarter uh, uh, annular earth space between those two assemblies. Then let's take a look at what's required for the fire stop system. It talks about the separation being max four inch and then the compression and extension. And then the joint system consists of a mineral wool forming material and then a film material. The mineral wool, it's specifying four pounds per cubic foot, 64 kg, installed as a permanent form. Cut, installed edge first into the joint opening, parallel with the joint direction, such that bat sections are compressed a minimum of 33%, and that they're recessed from both sides of the wall and firmly packed around each penetrant. If you're a special inspector, this firmly packed can be a little, maybe frustrating. If you're a contractor, it can also be frustrating, but it's there for a reason. 
there are certain areas that get difficult to get very exacting in the compression with the mineral wool. And obviously, in the fire test, the test sponsor, the manufacturer, packed that mineral wool in at a specific uh, density, not specific density, but as close as they could get to the same density as what the rest of the assembly is. UL has tested it this way, and it's passed the, the test. And the contractor's job is to represent as closely uh, as possible to this firmly packed. It does leave a little bit of variance, but it's noticed that it's only in the mineral wool. It then goes on to say that the mineral wool has to be by certain manufacturers, IIG, Rockwool, Roxel, and Thermofiber. Finally, a sealant is put over the top of it, a quarter of an inch. In this case, it's a Nuco product. Um, a film of film material is to overlap an inch, a half inch onto the wall uh, for the final assembly. So, the question would be is if uh, the manufacturer of the fire, uh, the uh, forming material is not one of these four, guess what? The special inspection agency is rejecting, and the uh, fire stop contractor then has to uh, either take it out or find themselves another system from that manufacturer that allows that to be in there. Another head, head of wall assembly, another uh, concrete bl uh, block or concrete assembly to um, uh, concrete floor. In this case, uh, three hour fire resistance rating with 25% plus or minus on the compression of the, of the extension. Looking at the mineral wool from the picture, you can see that the orientation of the fibers is horizontal. That allows for the compression up and down uh, and extension of that joint uh, and keeps it in the assembly so that it doesn't fall out. Especially important in uh, wall or floor assemblies if we were looking at a floor tested system. Describes the wall, describes the floor, and then describes the um, film material and forming material. In this case, Hilti has tested it only with rock wool manufacturer's Delta board possibly a prefabricated board um, of a certain thickness, four pound per cubic foot, bat cut to a minimum eight inch width, put into a, uh, a gap area of three and a quarter inches. So you can see it's almost a two to one compression on this one to come up with that assembly. Then the Hilti spray is supposed to go over the top of it at a CP672 a minimum overlap of a half inch onto the concrete floor and the concrete wall. Minimum eighth inch uh, wet material is sprayed on either side uh, in this assembly. It's not telling us what the dry thickness is, so then as an inspector you'd have to go look on the manufacturer's product data sheet to see what the dry thickness is to equate back to the wet thickness that is shown in this uh, tested and listed assembly. And that would be true for both uh, for any type of a sealant or liquid-based uh, product. All products will shrink some. The amount will vary based on the cure method of the sealant that, or spray that's used. The water-based sealants will shrink more than a silicone-based sealant and more than a urethane one-part sealant and more than a urethane two-part sealant or a silicone two-part sealant. Again, all of them will have certain shrinkage, except for, of course, the ones that expand as they come out of the tube, which would be the foam-based sealants, whether they're silicone or urethane-based foams that are used for fire stop systems. Pay particular attention to that. So we're going to look at another system. This one's a membrane penetration. And currently there's a discussion going on amongst uh, UL and the manufacturers and the contractors about can we use a through penetration or uh, as a one-sided through penetration fire stop system as a one-sided uh, membrane penetration. And that, that's been a good question. The, the testing laboratories have come back and said not in all cases. So from an inspection and a contracting perspective, best to use the tested and listed systems first. And there are membrane tested and listed systems for one side of the wall uh, and an engineering judgment later. Where does this come into effect? especially in metal penetrating items. Let's say the fire starts on this side of the wall and the metal penetrating item conducts heat 
inside the wall and then back up inside the wall. Could that breach into the wall cause this side of the assembly, the, the right side of the assembly on your screen, to fail prematurely? Good question. There was also another code proposal at the uh, code hearing uh, that talked about putty pads. Uh, not to change the subject, but if you look at the hole in the metal stud, uh, the, the code change proposal dealt with, uh, instead of non-commuting stud cavities, it dealt with uh, stud cavity spacing. And by taking out the communicating, it then uh, opened up a risk for uh, fire and smoke to go through these holes from one stagger of the stud, if you will, to the next. Different subject, but off we go. So system selection, very important and required in order to inspect fire stopping. Other things to look for, uh, what's the wall and floor fire rating? What's the annual space size? What's the penetrating item? What's the backing material? Is the penetrating item centered, off-centered? Do we need an engineering judgment? The engineering judgment is another area that requires a lot of care. We know it happens because not every system has been tested by the manufacturers. Even after they've invested millions of dollars and 9,000 plus systems in the UL directory, there's a lot to figure out uh, in, a, in a building and a lot of variability that takes place. I'm not going to go through the rules heavily, but here they are. First thing is, if there's no system from the manufacturer that was submitted, we find another system from a different manufacturer. Third, if there's no system in either case, we seek an engineering judgment. And where do we get that? We get that from the very first line in the International Fire Stop Council's engineering judgment guidelines for others to approve. The manufacturer's state don't use it in lieu of a tested system when available. One thing to remember when looking at engineering judgments is that there should be some manufacturer statement that talks about their feeling of the engineering judgment. Some manufacturers put on their engineering judgments that they believe it will pass a ASTM E814, UL1479, UL2079, whatever the tested system is, it'll pass that, uh, that, that test. And they should be stating that because they're making a self-certification in this case. Moving on from EJs, let's get to the, uh, uh, the basis of what fire stopping is. The easy part, sure, test and list systems is the big part. Pack, put the sealant in, tool it or smooth it. All sealants require tooling or smoothing from all the different manufacturers. Um, back to sleeves, I didn't spend any time on it last, this time. Spent a lot of time on it last time. If the system says the fire stop sealant's got to be installed at the plane of the floor and it shows up at the top of the sleeve, again, it's a reject. Secondly, if the sleeve says solid uh, steel pipe, schedule 40, and we show up and there's a, a 28 gauge sheet metal, again, reject unless the system allows. If we show up and the sleeve is a plastic sleeve and the system asked for metal, again, reject. Uh, wrong system used in that case. Let's get to the inspection piece where we can spend the appropriate amount of time on inspection. And get into the uh, inspection standards. Uh, before we get to inspection, we've got to remember that the installation is pretty important. Currently, there's no approved contractor program from any of the manufacturers where there's a contractual relationship that says that the contractor is required for two years on a warranty and the manufacturer is on the hook for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years for that installation. That's why the FCIA put together the FM approved contractor program and the UL qualified fire stop contractor program to bring some credibility to those contractors that have built a management system around tested and listed systems. The UL Qualified Fire Stop Contractor Program and the FM4991 program have four components to them. There's a management system built by the contractor. It's how they do as they say they do. FM or UL comes and audits that management system at the office to see if they've got systems pulled, and then they go to the field to check out and make sure that those systems are accurate. 
Thirdly, the FMRE well contractor has to employ a person that's passed the, the fire stop exam from FMRE well. That fire stop exam has to be passed. And then the person's appointed a DRI if they uh, pass the, uh, they're appointed a DRI only if the company appoints them. So that DRI status doesn't show up until they're employed by an FM or UL contractor. The annual audit takes place as well. What's their management system look like? It looks, if you look at this one and the description, and then move over to the International Accreditation Services uh, examination, uh, accreditation, these are all the same things that are required by the IAS AC291. What's the employee training? How do they select or analyze systems? How do they communicate those systems to the field? How do they label them? What are the non-conformances? And then how do they close out projects? So most importantly, let's get on to inspection. Inspection takes place via the ASTM E2174-2393 standards. Those ASTM standards, ASTM E2174-2393, are the standards for the on-site inspection of installed fire stops. 2174 is penetrating items, 2393 is joints and there's a specified way to, to uh, have it take place. International Fire Stop Council put on a, a guideline for uh, inspecting penetrating items. It's on the FCIA website. Later today, I'll post it uh, on the right-hand side in the hot news so you can get to it quickly. But what it basically says is that the fire stop sealants in the destructive method shall be cut in a triangle method and then the measurement taken at the bond line for the thickness of the fire stop sealant. Uh, that's not in the ASTM E2174-2393 standards uh, that the, the measurement be taken only at the bond line where the uh, uh, fire stop sealant touches the edge of the wall or the floor. And then again where it touches the penetrating item. Most of the inspection agencies that I know that are inspecting fire stopping do a measurement at both the bond line and then they do one again at the center of the sealant, factoring in the shrinkage value that is provided by the uh, manufacturer to the special inspection agency and the contractor. It may be communicated through their product data sheets or it's also communicated uh, uh, via a special letter from the manufacturer. Product data sheets are preferred because those are published items that wind up on websites and are everywhere. Let's talk quickly about inspection. Who really does inspection and why? You know, the building official, many people say, well, the building official should catch this, that, and the other thing. Their job is not to be the, man the uh, uh, construction manager of the building. Their job is to make sure that the code's enforced and that the interpretations and policies and procedures and should be in client uh, compliance with the intent of the code. Building official makes uh, uh, some required inspections. Uh, fire stopping is one of them. They should be looking at. It doesn't say whether they're supposed to cut them. There's not a requirement for 2% or 10% that needs to be done. It just says that the protection of joints and penetrations in the International Building Code Section 110.3.6 says that the penetrations and joints shall not be concealed from view until inspected or approved uh, and approved by the building code official. It goes on to say the building official can also accept reports of approved inspection agencies provided that those agencies to satisfy the requirements as to the qualifications and reliability uh, which are found in the, in the International Building Code. The approved agency has a definition of the code. The approved agency is the recognized and established agency regularly conducting and tests and furnishing inspection services when that agency has been approved. The agency can take any form. It can be a sole proprietor organization, so it doesn't have to have a corp corporate shell going on. It could be an individual who owns a their own company uh, that operates as a sole proprietor uh, as a, uh, on their uh, IRS tax form or whatever tax form, regardless where you are. And this is the International Building Code language. Secondly, it could be a LLC corporation, a sub S corporation, a C corporation, whatever entity that organization chooses, it can be uh, those organizations. And the building official has to approve that. The building official then approves the qualified person 
employed by the approved agency or retained by the approved agency and being approved by the building official is having competency necessary. The approved agency then when you get into special inspections and the ASTM E2174239 three standards are required by code in chapter 17 of the building code so it's invoked in the US and wherever the international building code is used in the 2012 version going forward. It says that approved agency shall provide all information to the building official to determine if the building official feels that that agency meets the requirements. Very important things that exist both in the ASTM standard inspection standards as well as the um, standards for uh, inspection are that the inspection agency has to be independent from the contractor, responsible for the work being inspected, and also disclose any possible conflict. So if the contractor owns both a inspection agency and a contracting company, it doesn't mean that the inspector in the field owns both, but let's say at the, at the top, at the ownership level, that both the uh, contracting company and the inspection company are owned by the same person or conglomerate, then that has to be disclosed to the building official who will make a determination if there's a possible conflict of interest. If that building official doesn't feel there's a conflict of interest, then there can be inspection that takes place by that similar company. But I, I think most times that the, the uh, building official will likely say, it looks like a conflict of interest uh, and you should be a separate company. It then goes on to say that the approved agency has got to have equipment to handle the test. And then personnel that are experienced and educated in conducting tests. There's also an important piece in here that talks about who should be hiring the special inspection agency. In some cases, uh, because it's not being complied to the code, the construction manager or general contractor is hiring the uh, special inspection agency. That's a potential conflict. The reason why is the general contractor really is responsible for schedule. Inspection can slow down the construction schedule because of rejections then the scenario could exist that the general contractor looks the inspector in the eye at the company that he or she works for and says, we'd like that you uh, cease and desist your inspections. We're done working with you. Come back at the end of the job. Thank you very much. Here's your check. Go home. This section of the code is written to prevent that. It puts the owner or the registered design prof professional in charge acting as the owner agent as employing the approved agency. That's huge. You know, it's just a, a two sentence, well, not even a two sentence, half of a sentence, but it really makes clear that who should be hiring the special inspection agency. Then the special inspector's got some uh, important things to prove to the building official, that they have competency and relevant experience, uh, as well as training. So the ex experience or training. Uh, can be provided. So competency, relevant experience. Relevant experience means if the special inspector has looked at a house and now they're going to do a high rise, 100 stories, I'm not sure that's relevant experience that qualifies that inspection agency to do this type of work. Then it also goes on to say that the registered design professional can also uh, act as the approved agency. So, quick question came in. It's worth noting that in some jurisdictions in Canada, as, re as a result of their codes, that the building officials are no longer doing any inspections on site and rely exclusively on the reviews performed by engineers and architects. That, that's a great point um, and brings up the need for the ASTM E2174-2393 standards in the codes. Moving on in the codes, uh, it, the International Building Code, and this is something that we want to bring forth to the National Building Code of Canada as well for a code change proposal uh, that high-rise buildings, so that's 75 feet, so a building with an occupied floor over 75 feet above the lowest level of fire department access. That's a mouthful because people say, well, does that mean if the building's 75 feet tall that it needs special inspection? No. 
means the occupied floor from the lowest level of fire department access. Lowest level would be if the building's on a hill and it's five stories, yet there's two stories underground in the front and two stories exposed on the back, guess what? The lowest level might be 75 feet higher than the lowest level of fire department access, therefore needing special inspection of fire stopping. So be careful how you refer to a high-rise building. Definitions are what starts wars in some cases, and that would certainly have it. And that requires the inspection standards. The inspection standards, ASTM E2174-2393, are standard practices for both penetrations and joints that are done by special inspection agencies that are uh, approved by the building official when required, approved by others when not required by the building code to be hired by the uh, building owner or manager. Specifications, however, always show that they should be hired by the building owner or manager. The second place that these are used is in Occupancy Type 3, 4 uh, in Chapter 16, Table 1604.5. So that means that's, that schools with more than 250 occupants, uh, assemblies, more than 500, I believe, is the number. Uh, so what it does is it spreads special inspections to a ton of different occupancies that are not just high-rise. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, so we also talked about the fact that the inspector firm and the inspectors have to be, in, have to be independent. The code has a, uh, a stronger statement uh, than the standard. I'm sorry, the standard has a, a stronger statement than the code in that it, it talks even more about divested from the installing firm, the distributor, the manufacturer, competitor, and supplier. The code simply says no conflicts. Uh, so the code basically says the same thing as the standard, although the standard has it a little bit more spelled out. Secondly, it says not a competitor, the installer, contractor, manufacturer, or supplier. The standards go on to say that the inspection personnel have to have two years experience in the construction field, accredited by the AHJ, which doesn't happen, although the International Accreditation Services is a division of the International Code Council. But the AHJ is not the International Code Council. The AHJ is the uh, authority having jurisdiction in that area. It's not required by code, but the International Accreditation Services has an uh, accreditation criteria for special inspection agencies called IAS AC291. It is built just like the FM and UL programs. It's meant for special inspection agencies and has a requirement for individual knowledge as well. The individual knowledge is that they have to pass, the inspector has to pass the UL and the FM or the FM fire stop exam. And those are good knowledge-based exams. It's not required by code, but it is specified in master spec uh, on projects that come up around the country. What is the uh, ASTM E2174-2393? First thing is a pre-construction pre meeting is mentioned uh, where the documents are reviewed, materials and systems are reviewed, and the inspection documents given by the authority or the uh, uh, authorizing agency, so that'd be the building owner or manager uh, or the uh, given to the inspector inspection agency by the uh, design professional, including the product data sheets, test and listed systems, and then the life safety drawings on the project so that that uh, company can find where those walls and floors are. It suggests a pre-construction meeting. Mock-ups can be done. Destructive testing can be done of those mock-ups, although not required in 2002-2174-2393. Installation measurements are taken to make sure the thickness of the fire stop sealant uh, or the number of wrap strips uh, is appropriate, uh, and then uh, the inspection method is discussed by the contractor with the uh, special inspection agency. Two methods. First one is 10% of each type of penetration, no less than one, per 10,000 square feet. 
and then 5% of the total lineal footage of uh, joint system, no less than one per 500 lineal feet is done as well. So that's the look over the shoulder method, the random witness. Um, random witness is whenever that installation company is installing, the inspector is on the job overseeing what's going, not overseeing, but watching what's going on. There's also a key point inside the inspection standards that says that the special inspection inspector is not to supervise the workers. And that's very important. Um, and then the post-destructive uh, testing method is that there's a minimum of 2% cut as well as minimum one for 500 lineal feet of uh, joint area, mandatory. If there's a 10% variance per fire stop type, the inspection stops, the installer then inspects their own work, repairs it, and then the inspector comes back and re-inspects it as well. The key point to know is that there's some differences between the code on the notification and the standard. The standard says notify the contractor, the insta inspectors to notify the contractor uh, within one day of the finding of a deviation. The building code says notify immediately. That's a huge difference in the communication from the special inspector to the installer through the appropriate channels immediately. With cell phones and email, that's very, very possible to take place and get done. But it's something to remember. I had a question come in during the inspection piece. Has anyone investigated the use of ultra, ultrasonic thickness measuring tool for determining installed system thicknesses? Um, I've always thought that's a great idea, but I've not heard of anyone using those. One of the reasons is that the special inspection purchased by the author authorizing agency uh, is usually done using the destructive method of testing that we see here. Why? Because it's less expensive than the um, over the shoulder. If you think about it, let's say that there's one fire stop contractor and five trades. That means that the special inspection agency company has to, has to staff up for five different companies installing fire stop on the same job, possibly at the same time. It winds up being much more expensive than waiting until afterwards, walking around a project site with the representatives of each of those firms and cutting the assemblies all at once. That's why the destructive method is, is done more. However, the ultrasonic thickness measuring tool could be used for both, in my opinion, and might make it a lot faster and more efficient to do it. So again, the 21742393, don't talk about the uh, notice of discovery, the building code, but it, it does talk about it, it says one day notice, but the building code says immediate. And if it's not corrected, then the in inspector is to notify the building official and the registered des design professional prior to completion of that phase of the work. We think this is a good thing for the inspector and for the installer. Why? Because those companies that don't take fire stopping seriously will get communicated to the building owner manager, the, the, the ultimate purchaser of products and services that are installed to be systems. Once the building owner manager figures out that things, things are not going right with one or two of the contractors or all, then the general contractor will get a big complaint. The general contractor's customer is the building owner. Therefore, we think uh, that the building owner will come down on the general contractor will then come down on the trades, which will result in a specialty fire stop contractor performing uh, more work on that project and getting it done right the first time. So we talked about uh, what happens with rejection. Uh, there's forms that are in the ASTM E2174-2393 that are delivered. Uh, the, the International Building Code also has a requirement for delivering a report and also talks about uh, discrepancies. Here's the port and the code where it talks about discrepancies being brought to the immediate attention of the contractor for correction. And then what happens uh, if they're not corrected uh, and what should be done afterwards. Final report from the inspection agency um, has uh, the inspection reports. So these reports from the inspection agency have to match up with the tested list systems that are submitted by the contractor, both at the final uh, action as well as the uh, uh, 
uh, inspection along the way. The contractor sends uh, all of these documents, product data sheets, the systems as they were built, the inspection documents, the warranty, the maintenance requirements. This all goes to the building owner manager so that they can maintain the fire stopping uh, throughout the life structure of the structure. Why is it important to specify the ASTM E2174-2393? Because we believe it, it verifies the field installation. When there's a, an accredited inspection agency, the AC291, we believe it results in a special inspection agency that's as qualified as the fire stop specialty contractor that it's installing. If we've got both entities with the same knowledge level, then the whole pro process of design, install, inspect, and maintain will work as a circle and work appropriately. So that covers the, um, the, the material that I wanted to, to cover today. We'll cover maintenance and management at one of our other programs. Again, if you want the uh, magazine, feel free to send us a, uh, an email to uh, fcia.org. If you're an architect or a contractor, or a specifier or a special inspection agency and you want to be a good see a good specification just go to fci.org left hand side download the specification effective compartmentation is a system uh, fire stop systems are an important part of it so at this point what I want to do is cover any of the questions that came in and there's one that came in from the Middle East that I didn't get to uh, cover so one question is if the civil contractor by mistake fills and seals the head of wall with normal cement mortar in a fire area zone, do we need to remove the cement mortar from the entire head of wall to maintain the gap and 10 millimeters and apply a, a fire stop system? That's a great question. So let's go back to that head of wall fire stop assembly that I had uh, up on the screen. Uh, that would be back, let's see, head of wall, here we go. So here's a head of wall fire stop system. Let's imagine that there's a um, concrete grout full thickness. One thing that we do know that's going to happen, regardless of fire resistance, is that that head of wall assembly, where the wall is, is not going to move. However, the floor above it, once it is loaded with heavy file cabinets, if an office structure, uh, desks, if it's a parking garage, cars are driven over it, et cetera, et cetera. That head of wall, which is not going to move from the wall below, but the floor itself will deflect some amount. That deflection can cause a uh, blowout, if you will. It'll cause the, the mortar, which is not forgiving and does not move, to pop out of the wall because of the compression that takes place from that uh, assembly itself. Secondly, if the um, specification says that the joints are to accommodate expected building movements, and you'll find that in all the specifications, whether they're, they're done by professional architectural firms in the Middle East, US or Canada, the engineers and architects are going to ask for that assembly to allow for accommodate and accommodate expected building movements. That means that the selection of the material has been incorrect and a flexible sealant should be used. So those would be the two things that I'd use first. The third thing I'd use is if the equivalent thickness is not appropriate to maintain the fire resistance rating of the assembly, uh, and let's say it's a concrete wall and they've used a mix of cement grout and it doesn't match the equivalent thickness of the wall, then they've uh, violated the assembly. In this case, it's calling for, for the wall assembly, eight inch thick steel reinforced concrete or normal weight structural concrete. It also says it can be made of any classified concrete block. Uh, the any classified concrete block is, um, any thickness. So if the concrete block had, a, had an area on each side with a hole on it and that area was one inch thick and the contractor put two inches of mortar in this area, they may wind up complying with the three-hour fire resistance rating. 
If not, then they've violated the system and it has to come out anyway. Certainly hope that I've covered your question um, and um, uh, on that one. Thank you. Moving on to the next question. It's worth noting that in some jurisdictions in Canada, the building officials are no longer doing any inspections. Okay, I've covered that one already. A final question came up, another question came up, may I get a copy of the presentation in PDF format? Yes, you can. Uh, I'll have this presentation posted at fcia.org uh, and it'll be, let me, let me uh, bring up fcia.org and uh, show you where it will be posted. It'll be posted uh, in about half an hour, 45 minutes after I finish the call. It'll be posted right here on the hot news. So be sure to go there and check it out because uh, that's where you'll find the, uh, the presentation. Next question, can I explain the maximum six inch penetrating item and 144 square inches of penetrating items in the 100 square feet floor for the T rating exception? Certainly, for me to do that, I'm gonna bring up the international building code. So give me a second to, uh, pull that up and uh, because what it what it says is the limitation for the type of T rating Let's see where I go uh, give me a second I'll pull this up pull this out of your way so you, you don't have to look at what I'm doing probably easier to see it when it's in print so give me a second here I'll bring up the 2015 International Building Code. So the exception for T ratings for the International Building Code is in Chapter 7. Um, and the allowance is in the beginning of the penetrating items. So let's go to penetration. Se section 715 is joints. You won't find it there. Uh, but you will find it in the section uh, uh, here in penetrations. So the penetrations, it deals with through penetration. It says through penetration shall comply, shall comply with section 714.3.1, 714.3.1.2. Those, when you scroll down, talk about ASTM E814 and UL1479. The ASTM E814 and UL1479, in order to pass those tests, the F and T rating are both required. When you come back up to uh, the exception to having to put in a tested and listed system, concrete, grout, and mortar can be installed when in concrete and masonry walls, so not in drywall, wall board, concrete masonry walls, when the penetrating item is six inches, the area of the opening through the wall doesn't exceed 144 square inches. Concrete, grout, or wall is permitted. Full thickness of the wall or thickness required to maintain the fire resistance rating. And then, so here it says protected by either of the following measures. The other measure is using ASTM E119 and then having the part about ignition of cotton waste uh, above the assembly on the cold side uh, so that it doesn't uh, transfer heat. But this exception from the uh, concrete has no exception as, or no requirement for that T rating. So that's where the issue comes in. And I hope I've explained it uh, appropriately. Um, and if I didn't, ask the question again. Next question that came in. Is the wall a bearing or a non-bearing wall? Uh, so the question would be, in a tested and listed system, is the, uh, the wall where the fire stop is installed load-bearing or non-load-bearing? Um, I can't tell that from the system that I have on the screen, because uh, it's not telling me whether it's bearing or load-bearing wall at, at, at all. Now this comes up to the discussion about is fire stop required for a, a rated wall that may be not for 
compartmentation purposes. Um, the FCIA and uh, many discussions throughout the uh, ICC's Code Technology Committee has come to the, to the uh, conclusion that the ASTM test tests ASTM E119 tests one side of the wall for fire attack. It doesn't test a double fire-sided attack. If there's holes in the floor of the wall, regardless of the sides, it will create a double fire attack and may uh, reduce the hourly rating of that assembly. How much? We don't know. All we know is that it reduces it. Um, that discussion has been going on for about six years uh, through various places. So good question. Thanks for asking it. Second question, another question. In ASTM E2174 10.6.2 stops the special inspector from cutting materials? Hmm, this is a good question. Let's bring back up the ASTM E2174 and take a look at what this questioner is asking. So let's get to 10.6.2. So at 10.6.2, the inspector shall not supervise or in any manner direct any aspect to the inst installation process. I think this includes, but not limited to the following. Okay, so look at the charging language. The charging language says the inspector shall not supervise or direct the installation process. So this really isn't the inspection process. This is the installation process. So the inspector can cut, but the inspector can't supervise the worker. That's what this section is really meant to discuss. So thanks for the question, but I'm not sure that the scope uh, was covered uh, well enough. So hopefully I covered that. Then let's go on. It says in X16.1.1 state special inspector needs razor knife to cut the, the, the fire stop. So I can see your confusion if you interpret that 10.16 is speaking to the inspector to not supervise the inspector installation process because so this really says that the inspector shouldn't be supervising the contractor. It doesn't say they can't cut their own test. Thank you. Second is which is it? If we don't cut, we can't be included in any claim or plastic pipe fails at the fire stop interface due to being kicked when the sample or nicked when the sample was cut. I think this kind of gets to the repairs. The repairs need to be done by the fire stop contractor. Uh, I think I'll try to get back to that picture uh, while we're on this uh, part of the uh, uh, presentation. So let me get back to the, to the picture where the uh, fire stop was cut. So this raises a really good question uh, on the inspection of fire stopping. So who cuts this? The inspector can cut it. The installer's got to fix it. Back to this uh, penetrating item here. What does that mean? That means that the installer and the inspector, the most efficient way is to have the foreman or the superintendent, uh, and this would all be covered during the uh, scope meeting that takes place at the beginning of the project before the fire stopping gets started. This is where the discussion of the inspection method takes place. During that discussion, it says, okay, um, who's gonna make the cut? The contractor may say, I'll cut it for you while you're looking over the shoulder. Well, the inspector says, nope, I want to do the cut for whatever reason, and that cut could take place. Now, as you can see here, the, the fire stop has been repaired by the, spe by the um, uh, fire stop specialty contractor um, and done to the appropriate thickness. The manufacturer's installation instructions need to say what the repair method is because the thickness of sealant in the repair may have to be more than the shrunk thickness of the fire stop product because it needs to shrink down to the appropriate thickness rather than shrink more than the appropriate thickness. So that's why the manufacturer has to be consulted on the shrinkage, not just for initial installation, but also for the inspection thicknesses as well. Great question, thank you for asking that. Secondly, another question comes up, can you discuss single source responsibility for fire stopping and its relationship to special inspections? Great question. What does the, the intent of the FCIA, and you know, it's kind of crazy when you see a, a fire stop contractor organization as being the author, the original author of the test standards before the manufacturers got involved, 
uh, at ASTM. So we hired a, FCI hired a consultant to help write these standards um, and then work together with the manufacturers through the ASTM process to build this standard. It's very unusual for contractor companies to ask for inspection, but we did. What's the relationship between these two things? We think that the circle of quality that I put up, design, install, inspect, and maintain, that when there's a special inspection agency that understands the fire stop protocol, you know, if something expand, it is greater than the annular space, uh, that's listed in the system, then we reject or we find another system. Uh, if any of the um, penetrating items are wrong, we're, we're doing the same thing. Those same questions should be asked by the special inspector who works for a special inspection agency, whether a sole proprietor or a company, we don't care. And it should be asked by the contractor employee uh, as well, such that both are on the same page. So we think that the relationship is it provides the building owner and manager the correct value for the installed fire stop. If a non-specialty contractor uh, can be as equally qualified as the fire stop contractor, maybe they became UL or FM uh, contractors, great. Uh, we don't preclude them. We haven't precluded them from getting either of those uh, certifications, not certifications, uh, accreditations, and, and never would. Uh, but we believe the specialty fire stop contractor is most efficient because the rejections may be less for that uh, company than they would be for the trades. For top and another question for top of wall and bottom of wall joints using a ULC listed drywall assembly. Do I know if the test if the test uh, for the assembly includes any fire stopping material, i.e. Is the use of drywall tape and mud at the top of the wall joint suitable? But the answer to that question is no. For the test standard for uh, fire resistance rated walls, they bolt a whole assembly without any holes and without any joints in it to the fire test assembly. So there's no holes in it, there's no mud and tape used on it. The only mud and tape that's used is right here. The mud and tape is on the joints of the wall board and those joints are to occur at a stud. The other mud that's required is for the tape or for the uh, screw heads. It may may or may not require it depending on the system. But the mud and tape that's required is for quote fire taping of the joints. Those joints already have a backing. They have a metal stud behind it of some kind or a wood stud behind it. Great question. Thanks for asking that. Next question. When confirming minimum thickness of cement for a corrugated deck, do we measure from the top of the corrugation or the bottom of the corrugation where it does it tell us to do so? Good question. I don't have the answer to that question off the top of my head on the corrugated metal deck. However, if we look at the system very quickly, so let me bring it up again. Let's take a look and see what it says. Uh, let's see, that's a solid concrete one. I don't know if I pulled up a metal deck system. So let me uh, let me see if I can, uh, well, I think it's better if we just say it. I don't know the answer to that question. I'm going to surmise that it's um, the concrete thickness has to be the amount of thickness, uh, that the corrugated deck is an addition. I don't know the answer. So let's check with uh, UL on that one and get back to you. T rating for through penetrations in 714.4.1. Hmm, I'm not sure I understand the question, so I guess what I'm going to have to do is ask uh, if you ask that question again, Mark. If you can ask that again, I'll get back to it. Secondly, another question material storage in the International Building Code is part of QC reporting. Does this documentation? fall into the required report from the inspector? That's a good question. Let's go back to two things. First one is the ASTM E2174-2393 and see what it says. First thing is the inspector shall be permitted to enter the premises, review documents, observe the installation process, inspect completed work. They, the inspector uses the inspection documents, 
the installer notifies the uh, inspector. The inspector comes out. The inspector verifies the construction detail. The inspector shall not supervise. Uh, it doesn't really say that the inspector should go look at the, where the materials are stored. Uh, it does say, though, in 3.2.9 that the materials shall have the listing and label, label level on it from the manufacturer and product description. It seems that the does not state where they should be uh, stored in the inspection standards. Um, so let's take a look at the International Building Code now in 2015 in the Building Code. I'm going to have to get to Chapter 17, Special Inspections, and see what it says for materials. So in Chapter 17, for materials of the Building Code, very quickly, it asks about labeling of the products and the materials. Um, but I don't see where it talks about storage of materials. I think we're going to have to look at the International Building Code and get back to you on that one as well. Uh, let's see what it says. Discrepancies, final report about inspection and test. I'm not seeing where that's required by the Building Code. So let's get back to you on that one. Uh, for the through penetration, what's the minimum separation between two different systems? leave and where is it mentioned? Good question. The minimum separation between the two different systems, which would be the floor system and the sleeve, is mentioned in the test and list system. It'll say that the sleeve must be cast in place. So that means there is no annular space. That it's cast in place. If it says that, then that has to be cast in place. If the system says there's a small annular space and that the fire stop can be used, then OK. But it's all stated in the test and list system. Thank you for that question. Next question, in the case of a PVC penetrant, there is access from one side of the wall for the fire stop material application. The manufacturer proposes intumescent strip over the PVC pipe in two layers and filling the rest of the inner space with a fire stop mortar. Is it a correct system? There is no chance to apply the material from both sides of the wall penetration to access one side only. Wow, that's a, that's a great question. I guess the question that you would have to ask on the engineering judgment is, Will the wall assembly pass a fire test from both sides? Because the fire stop system does not know if the uh, fire is going to take place from one side or the other. So it's a through penetration is the way I understand that uh, system and not a membrane penetration. The through penetration uh, needs fire stopping someplace. So it sounds like that the manufacturer of that fire stop assembly believes that it'll work in both places, or when the fire appears at either place, on the non-fire side or the fire side, because both sides of the wall are required by the codes. I would ask the manufacturer that question before accepting that engineering judgment. Next question, is the fire stop industry going towards a pre-manufactured sleeve that will have a twist lock visual cues be visually inspected without destructive testing? Uh, a company went with this technique for their hold down. Seems like a logical progression. Um, you know, that's a great question. There are some prefabricated kits that have been designed and made for plastic pipe applications um, and for cables. Uh, all of the manufacturers have various systems that cover these, whether they're for cable penetrating items uh, or metal penetrating items or plastic. Uh, there are several that already exist. It seems that they're not taking off for whatever reason, mainly because this assembly, if you look at the wood truss assemblies that are assembled, they're all assembled all at once. Whereas the penetrating items, the way the construction takes place for fire stopping, is that we're looking at a fire resistance of a penetrated wall. The wall is constructed at one time, penetrating items put in and the fire stops put in in three different pieces. So therefore, the uh, penetrating item company may or may not know where that penetrating item is going to take place because sometimes the walls aren't built yet. So they would not know where to position them when the penetrating items are laid and the wall is constructed after the penetrating items. 
so it, it really hasn't taken off for a, a bunch of those re reasons as well. Next question, what is the purpose of wrap strip around the penetrant and how it works during a fire? Great question, thank you very much for asking about the purpose of wrap strips. The purpose of wrap strips is the wrap strips are products similar to the um, uh, intumescent sealant, only they have a high powered intumescing agent in them. And what happens with wrap strips is as the plastic pipe is melting, the, uh, pla the uh, wrap strips are expanding at the same rate that that pipe is melting and then forming an insulating char in that space, pushing the plastic pipe closed and then closing up the space completely with that insulating char that stays in place for the period of time of the fire resistance rating of the floor or the wall. In this case, the F rating would be three hours. The intumescent wrap strips are installed with collars or they're sometimes done in the uh, hole, if you will, for a tuck-in design system. Good question. Thanks for asking it. Next question. When I discussed the T rating exception, I referenced 714.3 wall penetration. Uh, the person wanted me to explain the penetrating item for 714.4.1. Okay, great. Sorry about that. I apologize for missing that. Let's go back to Chapter 7 and look at 714.4.1, 1714.4.1. So this is horizontal assemblies. 714.4.1 talks about through penetration. 0.1.1 talks about t uh, installation to a tested and listed system. So here's the test and listed system, ASTM E814 or UL 1479 with the 2.49 pascals. F and T rating, not less than one hour, not less than the required rating of the floor penetrated. The exceptions are floors, floor penetration contained and located within the cavity of a wall above a floor or below the floor do not require the T rating. So let's say that that um, penetrating item is exposed down below but it happens to occur inside the wall in the uh, wall assembly. That assembly does not need a T rating. Exception two, for floor penetrations by uh, floor drain or shower drain contained and located within a concealed space of a horizontal assembly do not require a T rating. So those floor penetrations where, in, where there's drain in a tub or a shower where there's a, a membrane below the uh, assembly in a concealed space. So the membrane could be a drop ceiling, could be a drywall ceiling, uh, so that you can't see the, the next assembly above it. Do not require a T rating. The next exception is penetrations of maximum four inch nominal diameter directly into an enclosed electrical power switch gear don't require a T rating. So those are for cable penetrations or pipe penetrations that come into a metal enclosed electrical power switch gear. Do not require the T rating as well. Those are the places in 714.4.1.1. Looks like I'm at 1.2, 4.1.1 1 .1 and up. Uh, let's see. So I, those, those are the sections I've covered. Uh, I'm not sure if I've covered your question, but that's where we are in the 2015 building code. Next question, when 2174, ASTM 2174 refers to destructive test methods, do we perform destructive testing on both sides of the assembly? Good question. That'd be for wall assemblies typically, but from time to time it's on floors where you have both sides of the assembly as well. The through penetration assembly is both sides. The fire doesn't know whether it comes from one side of the assembly or both. I'd recommend doing both sides of the assembly to make sure that you've got coverage from both sides because the, the through penetration assembly is both sides of the assembly, not just one side of the assembly. That's what gives the whole fire resistance rated assembly its fire rating is both sides. How that factors into your 2% or 10%, that'd be something that you'd have to figure out because maybe that helps on your, uh, your numbers 
and reduces the amount of inspection required, passing along a savings to the building official or the building owner manager. Next question: The DIIMM requires generic knowledge on the subject from the authentic source and credited by AHJ. AHJA in Dubai have an accredited training center. Can FCI provide knowledge and training materials to create qualified, knowledgeable, and acceptable individual inspectors, company or companies employing knowledgeable, acceptable personnel? Uh, where we need a generic answer from the Industry Trade Association. Can FCI help? Happy to have further discussion with the Department of Civil Defense and the Department of Municipal, Municipal Affairs over there. Will be over in October. Happy to uh, schedule some meetings with them. Great question. Thanks for asking it. Next question: Does the inspection standard address how to inspect putty pad pads installed in electrical outlet boxes? Good question. Let's go back to the scope of ASTM E21742393. Uh, the scope of 2174 covers fire stops, as defined in ASTM E814. So the question would have to be asked, 2174 covers ASTM E814, do those putty pads cover E814? I think they may be covered under ASTM E119, but I'm not sure, but that'd be the first question to ask. Um, as far as the putty pads goes, the first side install can be done before the other faces but once both sides are installed, how do you inspect the putty pad packs? Good question. Good question on that one. Um, the putty pad should be installed uh, such that you have access to observe them if that's part of your scope of work. You'd need to uh, observe both sides to make sure it's there as part of your program. However, if you take the uh, if you take the destructive method, that means you're taking the box apart, possibly taking the wall apart. If it's done on a random basis, then uh, you and the authorizing agency have to make a decision from the inspection perspective. Uh, how many times do you need to see both sides of that wall to be effective? Uh, you're going to need to see both sides of the wall in order to make sure, especially in the same assembly. That would mean you would need the construction process for the drywall not to start before you have inspected both sides of the wall assembly. Sounds like more of a coordination issue on the construction than it does an uh, inspection issue. OK, uh, I've got a question back from Mark uh, about the um, agency. Uh, so let's get the International Building Code back up for the 2015 version. And he says 714.4.1, the exceptions. OK, so here we are, 714.4.1, the, the exceptions. Let's see where I was here. OK, 714.4.1, through penetration exceptions. Here it talks about you can use either or. Penetrations by steel, ferrous, copper, et cetera, et cetera, or vents through concrete masonry items through a single fire rated floor assembly where the annular space is protected with the materials that prevent the passage of flame and hot gases when subjected to ASTM or E119, et cetera, et cetera, are permitted. Penetrating items with a maximum of six inch shall not be limited to the penetration of a single fire resistance rated floor assembly provided the aggregate area of the opening doesn't exceed 144 square inches in any 100 square feet of floor area. So what that does is limit the, uh, the size of the opening as it goes through multiple floor assembly. The second uh, exception talks about penetrations by the floor. So in this one, if you're using concrete to fill the assemblies, it's got to be tested to ASTM E119 or UL263. So it's a question. If uh, you show up as the inspector and there's concrete in the floor, um, A, where's the test and listed system to the concrete contractor through the general contractor? B, um, are the penetrating items appropriate? And does the uh, thickness of the concrete, full thickness of the floor, or the thickness required to maintain the fire resistance rating? And then thirdly, um, if it's for electrical boxes, 
Um, they have to be installed to the tested list uh, to the uh, the instructions included in the listing. But let's go back to the penetrating items. This guy here refers to Chapter Seven, uh, the equivalent thickness to get the rating. Chapter Seven, Section Seven Twenty Two, calculated fire resistance. If you get to Seven Twenty Two Point Two One One One, it talks about the aggregate of concrete and then the minimum slab thickness for a fire resistance rated. If it's lightweight concrete for a three-hour assembly, it's 4.4 inches of concrete to come up with the equivalent thickness to get a three-hour fire resistance rating. That's where that's found to figure out, well, how thick do I need to go to figure out the fire resistance rating for that? Thanks for asking the question. Hope I covered it for you. Next question. In case of pre-installed duct penetrance, without a fire damper. We can give only smoke seal rating. So if for one penetration, it's a smoke seal rating, how can we give a fire rating for other penetrations in the same fire zone? Good question. Let's get back to the presentation. I'll get back to the area that talks about duct work, penetrating fire resistance rated walls. There are tested and listed systems for duct work as they penetrate fire resistance rated walls and floors. That duct work uh, without a fire damper can be fire stopped to provide a fire resistance rating. If someone said and gave an engineering judgment in a fire rated wall saying, sorry, we can't give you a fire rating, but we can give you a, quote, smoke seal, I would say they're wrong in two ways. First is they missed the fire rating part. Second is a smoke seal can only be provided with a product that assembles it looks very closely, a, a product that is installed in a system that looks very close to a fire stop system, and that fire stop system has an air leakage rating. The L rating is the suitability for use for fire stop products used in a specific application. Air leakage rating is required really to say anything has any smoke resistance. So uh, if they wanted an engineering judgment, uh, I'm sorry, let, let's say it's a, a non-fire damper rated duct, then we would go to the CAJ 5000 series, not 5000, CAJ 1000 series, to find the uh, metal duct penetration without a fire damper to give a fire resistance rating. Good question. Next question, what's the status of ICC's uh, Fire Stop Special Inspector Certification Program? Uh, as, from, as far as I know, the International Code Council uh, has not yet started its uh, uh, certification for uh, fire stop uh, inspectors, and I'm not sure what the scope of that's going to be, whether it's for the uh, jurisdiction inspector, the special inspector, or both. I'm not sure. At some point, they'll have some kind of an exam of some kind. Uh, as stated earlier, the FM4991, I'm sorry, the FM fire stop exam, the UL fire stop exam, cover the tested and listed systems, selection, analysis, and are the basis that are available right now, third party, uh, to verify that the special inspector has experience in, and uh, knowledge as well. Okay, so the question came in about duct work. Um, and it clarified that this duct is not a metal duct, but a fiberglass or pre-insulated duct. So the question I'd ask back is two things. First one is, is the insulated duct solid fiberglass duct? And if so, then that one's a difficult one to fire stop. Um, it may require pulling out the, fi the uh, fiberglass duct as it goes through the fire rated wall, putting in a fire damper, and then having the fiberglass duct work match up to that metal duct work somehow. Um, and you'd have to use the, the code requirement for how far away from the fire resistance rate assembly could that fiberglass duct work get started and uh, uh, provide the appropriate protection. The fire damper is needed to provide the continuity of the fire resistance rating of the wall. Because I'm not sure there are any fire stops that uh, will cover a large fiberglass duct system. If it's a small fiberglass duct system, check with the man 
manufacturers of fire stopping. Even if it's a big one, check with the manufacturers of fire stopping. If they have a test and list system for it, it may cover that as well. Thank you. Great, great question. Really appreciate that. Um, so it looks like the questions have stopped coming. Uh, so I'll instead move over to the uh, the questions uh, that people have their hands up on to see if there are further questions from the audience along the way. Okay, so there's a, a person named uh, Ben Reeves who has a question mark up. Ben Reeves, I've opened up the microphone for you. Do you have a question? Ben, do you have a question? Okay, so no question there. If you have one, please type it in and I'll get to it. Uh, Next question was from Boris Joseph. Uh, Boris, I think uh, that I've covered your questions through the question and answer session. If you had another question, feel free to ask it. I've got the microphone open for you. Thanks, Boris. Uh, no problem. Moving down further, question from uh, Jack Fingold. Uh, Jack Fingold, I've uh, opened up the, uh, the microphone for you. Have you got a question? Okay, I saw you had one come in that I answered already, so uh, no problem there. Next question was from Jack Fawcett or Jeff Fawcett. Jeff, I've opened up the microphone. Do you have a further question? Okay, no question there. Moving down further, uh, next question was from uh, Laura Russell. Laura, I've opened up the microphone. Do you have another question? No, thank you. Okay, thanks, Laura. Next question was from Mark Fuji. Mark, you and I had a go back and forth on several. If you have more questions, feel free to ask. I've got the microphone open for you. Okay. Next question was, uh, I know Michael Phillips, uh, you and I had gone back and forth on some questions there. Have you got further questions or did I cover what you needed covered? Michael Phillips. Open the microphone. I've opened the microphone for you. Further questions? Okay, thank you. Next question, uh, Ranish uh, Rahim. Ranish, I've opened the question for you. Ranish, do you have a question? Okay, no question there. Down to Rose Scarup. Rose, I've opened the microphone for you. Do you have a question? Thank you. Next question was from Saifuddin Taher in the, uh, Sharjah or Dubai. Uh, Saifuddin, do you have a question or did I cover it for you? Thank you, Saifuddin. It was great to see you last week. Uh, next question is from Thomas Smith. Uh, Thomas, do you have a question? I've opened up the microphone. Thomas Smith, do you have a question? Okay. Sometimes people... Uh, have the question mark up from when I asked earlier, so no worries if you if you don't hop on. Uh, next question is from Tom Smith. Tom Smith, I've opened up the microphone. Did you uh, have a question? No. Nope. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, next question that came in was, I can't seem to find where information regarding FM and UL special inspection tests is located. Can I clarify? Okay, great. Um, the International Accreditation Services IAS AC291 is not required by code. The FM and UL exams are also not required by code. All that's required by the building code is the following. The building code requires that the special inspector who is working for an approved agency provide written documentation demonstrating competency or relevant experience or training. The FM and UL fire stop exams are a way to demonstrate that competency, relevant uh, and training. Because the, if you passed an exam, you must have had some training. Whether that training is self-training, reading a book, osmosis, whatever it is, that's your training. And it's been declared as uh, relevant. So uh, it doesn't mandate that somebody has to pass the FM or UL fire stop exam. It just says you have to prove to the building official experience, training, and relevance. 
thanks for the question. Next question comes up on uh, on perimeter fire containment. Do we have some? And we have a question on perimeter fire containment. So I'll get back to the perimeter fire containment. I kind of breezed over it very quickly and didn't cover it very well earlier on today. So let's get back to perimeter fire containment. Perimeter fire containment. The test standards ASTM E2307. It's a specific field directed construction, floor with a fire rating, curtain wall with no hourly rating, and then material in between. Material would be clips, possibly mineral wool, and then some kind of a spray over the top of it. They're tested through ASTM E2307, which has an interior fire attack to prevent fire spread from the interior part of the assembly and an exterior fire attack as well. The installation, the mineral wool has to be installed uh, compressed and compressed installed with the orientation of the mineral wool upward and then compressed, put into the assembly and then some kind of a spray put over the top of it. Okay, so what is the question on the, um, oh, on the uh, uh, fire containment? It says, we can, cover, can we cover that in another webinar? Happy to cover that in the next webinar, no problem at all. And we can cover it in a specific webinar because this is a very technical detail and really needs that. So thank you for that question. So I've gotten to the end of the questions that have been typed in by the attendees. And the good thing is we've had almost 45 minutes of questions from the attendees. And I can't thank you enough for asking those questions. I'm really glad to, uh, uh, to take them. And it really proves that these webinars that we do offer value to the FCIA member contractor, special inspection agency, and then the friends of FCIA. We don't charge money for these webinars. We open them up for the good of the industry, for the good of fire and life safety. And that's part of what an association does to build um, fire and life safety as an association by giving back to the industry, industry knowledge so that we can all wind up at the end of the day knowing that the fire stops have been installed to the tested and listed system and uh, provide the life safety that people need. So. Unless I see any questions in the next couple of seconds, I'll thank everyone for taking their time out of a busy day and a busy week to be on the webinar. Wish everyone a great, uh, in the U.S., a great Memorial Day weekend. It's our long weekend here. I know our Canadian friends had their long weekend last weekend. And if you go to the United Arab Emirates, uh, their long weekend to celebrate uh, uh, the Emirates is another time of the year. I don't remember whether that's the uh, summer or the fall. I think it's the fall because it's so hot during the summer there. So thank you to everyone for attending FCIA's webinar. Uh, you will receive a certificate uh, from Lindsay or one of the other staff at the office, possibly Kathy, within the next uh, uh, two weeks. So look for that certificate in the next two weeks. If you're not a member of FCIA, we certainly hope you would join us. Uh, because we try to work together as an industry to improve fire and life safety. Really appreciate that. did have one more question come in. I'll go ahead and take it. In our state and neighboring states, there's pushback from building officials to acquire an individual to obtain an, an exam as uh, evidence of their fire stop knowledge, uh, primarily the cost or lack of availability. Currently, ICC has tests. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is there an effort to make the UL and FM exams more affordable and available? I'll say yes to both. The FM and UL exams are offered five different places throughout the year. And they're offered at uh, SCIA conferences. We had one in Dallas two weeks ago. They're also offered in uh, at UL's facility in Northbrook, Illinois. Uh, they're offered. Uh, in New York. Uh, they'll be offered in Phoenix later on this year as well. We're working with you well on a uh, way to have it more available and possibly less expensive as well. We look to have some announcements of that sometime before the next conference. So keep an eye out. Look for something. Uh, we're getting there as quick as we can on that as well. The International Code Council is a very respectable organization and we're very pleased to have a partnership with them. As a matter of fact, the uh, the, the book that they put out, um, I spent the better part of two days helping uh, provide input for that along the way as well. The book is quite good, quite nice, but it covers 
codes and where in the code you'll find fire stopping. Um, the two books, the FCIA Manual of Practice plus the ICC book, we think make a pair that are a good complementary uh, effort by both uh, organizations. As far as the cost goes, we're, we're really glad that many of the special inspection agencies have invested in the IAS AC291. Why? Because any business has an investment to get into it, to have the right management system, and to have individuals that have passed a very credible exam. To get in business, regardless of whether it's contracting or inspection, uh, to get in that business requires investment. It requires investment by the company to provide the right procedures to get the inspection done appropriately and by the company to provide employees that can do that inspection appropriately as well. The FM exam or the UL exam are both under $700. Uh, the, FM, or the UL exam is $550. So if you think about it, if the company is going to make its profit dollars throughout a year and it only costs $550 per individual to provide an exam, that's not much of a capital investment from a business perspective when you look at the scheme of things. An entertainment budget for the special inspection agency or the contractor, think about it. Take uh, four people to a football game, $200 a piece for the tickets, there's $1,000. Uh, if you take five people, uh, you know, 100 bucks a piece for uh, dinner, there goes uh, another five. Uh, you know, buy some stuff at the, at the uh, ball game. You're up to a couple thousand dollars for four to six people doing some entertaining. This is an investment in the company's business, and we certainly hope that companies, both contractors and special inspection agencies, spend the money to get it done. Can we all do it cheaper? Yeah. Let's keep trying together to reduce the cost so it costs less for both the inspection agency and the contractor. FCI is working on that as we speak, and, and hopefully we'll have some announcements for you here shortly. Really appreciate that question. I'm not seeing any other uh, questions come in, so again, I'll, I'll thank the individuals who are on the line uh, that uh, spent time with us. I really appreciate that time. And thank everyone that's a member for being a member. Really appreciate that as well. Uh, and we'll look forward to uh, talking with people during the next webinar, uh, which takes place in June. And we've got that scheduled. Uh, well, keep an eye on the website. I don't have it in my head. My apologies. I thought I did. So everyone, have a great uh, upcoming weekend. Thanks again for taking time to be on the webinar. And uh, look for your certificates in the mail or the email. Actually, the email is where you'll find it over the next couple of weeks as our staff uh, compiles them. The um, electronic version of this program tells us uh, where the, um, or who the people were and how long they were on the call, so we're able to pull that as well. So have yourself a great weekend and a great rest of the week, and thanks everyone for being part of the uh, program.